You may be seated. I think some of the very best quotes are on the subject of joy. C.S. Lewis said this, he said, joy is the serious business of heaven. Matthew Henry said this, the joy of the Lord will arm us against the assault of our spiritual enemies and put our mouths out of taste for those pleasures with which the tempter baits his hook. Max Lucado wrote the following, he said, I choose joy. I will invite my God to be the God of circumstance. I will refuse the temptation to be cynical, the tool of the lazy thinker. I will refuse to see people as anything less than human beings created by God. I will refuse to see any problem as anything less than an opportunity to see God. I choose joy. Ronald Newhouse said this, he said, there's nothing more contradictory than an unenthusiastic Christian. The Bible tells us that God loves us so much, in fact, that God gave his only son so that all who believe in him will have everlasting life. Nothing, not even death, can separate us from God's love. If we really believe that, we can't help but overflow with joy. Finally, an anonymous quote. When was the last time you laughed for the sheer joy of your salvation? People are not attracted to somber doctrines. There is no persuasive power in a gloomy and morbid religion. Let the world see your joy and you won't be able to keep them away. To be filled with God is to be filled with joy. Say that last sentence with me. To be filled with God is to be filled with joy. Amen. Open your Bibles today to the Gospel of John, chapter 16. John 16. I know some of you are thinking, I thought we were finishing Nehemiah today. We are. We're just finishing Nehemiah in John, chapter 16. Let me recap the story we've been studying for the last five weeks or so. Nehemiah, in Hebrew, Nehemiah. His name means Yahweh comforts. Nehemiah is a type and a shadow, a symbol for the Holy Spirit. He hears that the children of Israel have returned from Babylonian captivity. They've been released and they've come back to live in Jerusalem and they've rebuilt the temple there. The temple symbolizes us the moment we receive Jesus Christ as the Lord of our lives because the Bible tells us we are the temple of the living God. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So now the children of Israel are back in Jerusalem. The, the temple has been rebuilt, but Nehemiah gets word that the walls, the protective walls around the city are in shambles. They're in disrepair. They've been destroyed. They've been crumbled. Even the gates have been charred with fire. They've been burnt. The protective walls around the city of Jerusalem represent our soul, our mind, our will, and our emotions. You see, the moment you believe in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to live in you. But then you start the process of rebuilding your life, of fortifying your life, of having your mind renewed because we need the protective walls around our spirit rebuilt. Here's why Ecclesiastes says this, if there's a breach or a gap in a wall, a serpent can come through and bite. You see, if an ancient city didn't have walls around it, their enemies could come in and plunder. And if you and I don't have wholeness in our soul, the enemy can come in and affect and influence and impact our lives. Nehemiah leads the charge in the rebuilding of the wall. How many of you are glad that the Holy Spirit leads the charge in the rebuilding of your life? All along the way, the enemy stops and tries to infiltrate and tries to delay and tries to discourage the people from rebuilding. And there were enemies for Nehemiah. Their names were Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, the Ashdodites, the Ammonites. They came in and they tried to mock and they tried to stop and delay and deceive. And there is an enemy that wants you to stop. 
stop rebuilding your life. He doesn't want your walls around your soul to be rebuilt. He's not Sanballat or Tobiah, but Paul the Apostle said, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. Listen to me carefully. The enemy doesn't want your soul rebuilt because he comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And if your life is rebuilt, if you're in a, a healthy emotional place, if you have emotional stability, spiritual maturity, you're restored. He restores your soul. If you get to that place, the enemy has no place in you. Amen. Amen. So last week we saw that after all of this, after all of the enemy infiltration and the enemy trying to mess with the people of God, even, even to the point where they got to a place where they got discouraged at one point, and they said, you know what, there's just too much rubbish, there's too much rubble, these walls have been broken down, this, this is really hard, that Nehemiah would gather the people together and he would encourage them and he would inspire them. He'd fire them up and say, you know what, it's time to fight, it's time to fight. For your family and fight for your sons and fight for your daughters and fight for your future again in the new testament paul the apostle tells us to fight the good fight of faith and they did they rallied together and the walls were rebuilt we saw it last week and the gates were hung the city was fortified and the bible says it happened in 52 days just 52 days that is absolutely miraculous when you think about it. This is an ancient city. This is before the days of Caterpillar and, and, and John Deere and, and Mack Truck. They had to do it with levers and pulleys and back-breaking hard work. But they got it done in 52 days. And the reason why is because our God is able to sovereignly activate divine, supernatural acceleration in our lives. Our God does suddenlies from cover to cover in your Bible. Walls are built. Gates are hung. And then Nehemiah calls to himself Ezra. Ezra's a priest and a scribe. He's a Levite and a scribe. It's the book before Nehemiah, Ezra. He was the one who led the charge in the rebuilding of the temple. Ezra's name means helper as well. So he is also a type and shadow of the Holy Spirit. And Ezra comes as the priest, as the scribe. He has the Torah. He has the scrolls. Let me, though, tell you just a little bit of background on Ezra. There's something I want to point out. In Ezra, the book of Ezra, chapter 7 and verse 10, it says this about him. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach statutes and ordinances in Israel. I just wanted to say something to you this morning, and that is this. God is preparing some people in this room. I said God is preparing some people in this room. He's preparing you for your next season of life. He's preparing you for promotion. He's preparing you to go to the next level. He's preparing you to step up and to step out and to be used by him. God is preparing some people in this room for what he's about to do in this church. He's preparing some of you to be used by him here in our next level, in our next season. For instance, in the next six to nine months, we are going to roll out a brand new, expansive, church-wide, small group strategy. Six to nine months from now, we're going to roll it out. And God is preparing people. God is preparing some of our old leaders and some brand new leaders to lead small groups of all different kinds that will meet in all kinds of places. Some of you will meet here. Some of you will meet in living rooms. Some of you will meet in coffee shops. Some of you will meet on ball fields. Some of you will meet on basketball courts all over the state of New Jersey. Listen to me. It will be dynamic. It'll knit us together in one respect. It'll open doors for new people in another respect. It will be a catalyst for both discipleship 
and friendship, and we need leaders. God's preparing you. Epic Youth, our, our, our youth ministry needs, new, needs small group leaders right now, committed and prepared small group leaders right now for what they do every Sunday morning. God is preparing people in this room to step up and to lead. So how does God prepare us? Well, the same way he prepared Ezra. He prepares us by inviting us. He invites us. He beckons us. He, he, he prompts us inwardly to seek him. You want to get prepared? Seek God. I said if you want to be prepared for anything in life, seek God. Ezra prepared his heart to seek the Lord. Moses sought the Lord. Elijah and Elisha sought the Lord. Uh, a man after God's own heart, the shepherd boy who became shepherd king, the sweet psalmist of Israel, none other than David, was famous for how he sought the Lord. In Psalm 27, I love what he wrote there. He wrote, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. Man, somebody needs to hear that this morning. I said, somebody needs to hear that this morning. In the time of trouble, he will hide you. So prepare your heart. Seek him. Ezra prepared, Ezra prepared his heart to seek the Lord. Seeking the Lord means to seek his ways. It means to seek his will. It means not my will, but thy will be done. Seeking the Lord means to spend time with him. To spend time in his word. To spend time in prayer. It means to get more experientially acquainted with him. You know, seeking the Lord is getting to know him is what it is. Spending time in his word in meditation and reflection on his word. Being still and listening for the voice of God. The Lord prepares us by inviting us to seek him. But it doesn't end there. It didn't end there for Ezra. Notice again, Ezra 7.10, for Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it. And to do it. It's one thing to academically know something. It's another to do it. It's one thing to intellectually or cerebrally agree with the principles and truths of the Bible, but it's another thing to put it into play. It's another thing to practically apply this word to your life. Je Jesus said, if someone is a hearer of his word and not a doer, he said, you're just building your life on sinking sand. And, and when the inevitable storms of life come, and by the way, the storms of life are inevitable. They come. They come to everybody. They come to people who have no faith. They come to people who have great faith. Storms come to everyone. Your faith does not exempt you from a storm. The reason why you have faith is for the storm. But when the inevitable storms of life come, if you're a hearer only, Jesus said it's all just going to come tumbling down. But if you're a doer of the truth, if you're a, a doer of the word, even when a superstorm comes, you'll be standing on the other side and you'll actually be stronger for having gone through it. Ezra was prepared by seeking the Lord, then he applied the word to his life. And then, did you notice, then he taught others, then he had an impact on others, then God used him in the lives of other people. Listen to me carefully. The people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Oh, say it with me this morning. The people, come, hello, say it with me this morning. Ready? The people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Oh, listen, we got it. That was just so weak. That was like, the people who know their God. 
Man, if you can't get excited about that verse, you better check your pulse. <laughs> Let's say it again. And when we say strong shall be strong, I want everybody to show you. All right, everybody sh show your guns. All right, ready? Ready? The people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great. That's more like it. Amen. Amen. Listen, God is preparing you. He, he is prompting you right now to get serious about your relationship with him. He is drawing you by his spirit to seek him. He has opened the door for you to venture out and actually be a doer of the word so that you can reach out to other people, so that you can have an impact, so that you can teach his word to others, so that you can teach by example, so that people can see Jesus Christ in and through you, so that wherever you go, you can preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. God wants to use you in the lives of other people. He, he, wants you to, he wants to use you to teach your children well and to teach your children's children. He wants to use you so that he can raise up the next generation to be stronger than we ever were. He wants to use you in your community. He wants to put you in a place of influence. He's making you a kingdom builder. Nehemiah calls Ezra. They actually build a wooden platform, and he stands on a platform because it's a huge crowd. It's all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Ezra takes out the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, the Septuagint, the law of Moses. It's on a scroll, and Ezra, the Levite scribe, takes the scroll, and he opens it up. He stands on that wooden platform and he says in a loud voice, Bereshit bara Elohim et Hashemayim vahet haaret. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Say it with me this morning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it was the first time the vast majority of them ever heard those words they'd been in babylon they'd been in captivity the, the scrolls were kept from them for 70 years so that means anybody under the age of 70 had never even heard this read before ezra read literally from sun up till midday the people stood in honor of the reading of the word. And they stood there for like six hours. The Bible says that there were other teachers that were appointed amongst the crowd. Anointed and appointed teachers who would come. And the Bible says they would give the people the sense. In other words, they would break it down. They would unpack it for them. They would, they would be able to make sense of what Ezra was reading from the law. And then the Bible says the people wept. They wept. All, th this giant crowd starts to weep. They start to cry. They start to wail. They wept. Because as they heard the law of God for the first time, they knew they didn't measure up. They, they, they knew, now that they'd heard it, they knew that they, they had broken the law of God. Now, for the first time, they actually knew why they were in captivity in the first place. And they cried. And they wept. The whole crowd is wailing. And then in Nehemiah chapter 8, it says, And Nehemiah, who was the governor, Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. 
for this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Say that with me. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Personalize it and say my. For the joy of the Lord is my strength. The people are weeping, they're wailing, they're crying. Ezra and Nehemiah, stop them. You know, if this was in the New Testament, it would probably sound a little bit more like this. Okay, wait a second. I know you feel guilty. I, I know you've got godly sorrow. I know you feel convicted, and that's good. That's, that's fine, that's good, that's healthy. But, but at the same time, you need to know something. You still, simultaneously, as you take ownership, that's great. But know this, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Hey, listen, it is imperative to own your own mistakes. We, and we all miss the mark. Can I get an amen? amen? All have fallen short of the glory of God. There's no one righteous. No, not one. There are no perfect people. But li so, so what does that mean? Conviction? Yes. Condemnation? Never. Amen. Why can we have no condemnation ever? Because Jesus Christ himself has paid the price. He has, he has absorbed the penalty for our sin. My, listen to me. Today, receive Receive your forgiveness that was purchased for you on Calvary's cross and be free of guilt, shame, and condemnation. Listen to me carefully. Don't beat yourself up forever. Don't wallow in guilt for too long. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. If God has forgiven you, forgive yourself. The people are told, stop, stop weeping. Start eating. Eat the fat. <laughs> Drink the sweet. Send out portions. Listen, you can only send out portions if you have more than enough. Send out portions. You freely receive, freely give. Be radically generous. Eat the fat, drink the sweet. Send out portions. My family, you know what this is a picture of? Again, remember when this is happening. The, the walls are built. The, the, the gates are hung. This is a picture of wholeness. This is a picture of what it is to be like for the believer whose walls have been rebuilt, who's being transformed by the renewing of his or her mind. Listen to me. This is someone who's closed the gaps on the enemy, somebody who has learned to put up healthy boundaries. This is a follower of Jesus Christ who has become emotionally poised, spiritually buoyant, who knows how to withstand the attacks of the enemy who knows how to properly respond to the critics and the haters. This is somebody who knows who they are and knows, and knows whose they are. Eat the fat. Drink the sweet. And know this, you're blessed to be a blessing. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life. Listen to me. He didn't say, listen, when he said life, he used the word zoe. He didn't use bios. He didn't say, I've come so that you could exist. He didn't say, I've come so that you could breathe, so that you could fog up a mirror, so that you could actually have vital signs. No, no, no. He said, I have come that you may have zoe, life in the absolute sense, life as a principle, life as God has it within himself, that you might have the God kind of life. He said, I have come that you might have Zoe life and have it more abundantly. This is a picture of the abundant life. The life that Jesus came and, and gave his life to give you. Paul told 
Timothy that God has given us richly all things to enjoy. And a key component to that kind of blessed life where, 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 where you're blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, where you're blessed in the city and you're blessed in the country and you're blessed when you go out and you're blessed when you come in, where you have all things that pertain to life and godliness, where you are walking in and experiencing Experiencing the benefits of being positioned as the head and not the tail, above only and never beneath. Where, where he satisfies your mouth with good things, where he daily loads you with blessings so that your cup runneth over. Listen to me carefully, a key, indispensable ingredient to that kind of life is joy. Joy. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Oh, say it with me again today. Ready? For the joy of the Lord is your strength. Turn to the person that tell them. Say, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Tell the other person, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now one more time, personalize it and say my strength. Ready? For the joy of the Lord is my strength. It's the pinnacle, it is the zenith moment in the book of Nehemiah. And it is pivotal, it's a vital part of our existence as believers in Jesus. So for the rest of our time together, I want us to put this biblical principle and experience of joy, let's put it under the microscope. Let's, let's take a look at the who, what, when, where, and how of joy. To do that, we'll be in John chapter 16. Have you found John chapter 16 yet? John chapter 16, we'll begin reading in verse 19. Now Jesus knew that they desired to ask him, and he said to them, Are you inquiring among yourselves about what I said? A little while, and you will not see me. And again, a little while, and you will see me. Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament. But the world will rejoice, and you will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. A woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again. And your heart will rejoice. And your joy, no one will take from you. And in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you've asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive that your joy may be full. This is not the joy of a party. This, 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 this is not giddiness. This is not babbling brook joy. You know, a babbling brook makes a lot of noise, but it's pretty shallow. This is deeper than that. This is a river of joy that has almost no noise at all. The deep joy, biblical joy, goes down into the deepest recesses of your heart. And it cannot be extinguished. It cannot be taken away. The joy that Jesus gives you will never be snuffed out. It can never be banished. And even if it is temporarily overshadowed or subdued by some sort of sorrow, I'm here to tell you that joy always comes back. Joy is resilient. It has awesome bounce back ability. Joy will always resurface. You see, for the believer in Jesus, joy is inevitable. Jesus said, and your joy, no one will take from you. How many of you know that's good news? I said, that's good news. No one can take your joy from you. You, you, you have an unconditional joy. You have an unshakable, unchanging, irrefutable undefeated and undefeatable joy. 
In Romans chapter 14, the Bible says the kingdom of God is joy. Galatians 5 says that joy is one of the nine traits of a transformed heart. 1 Peter 1.18 says that we have a joy that is inexpressible. It says it's joy unspeakable and full of glory. You see, the joy that Jesus gives is not tethered to circumstance. This is not the joy that the world offers. This is completely different from happiness. This is not happiness. Happiness happens when all the happenings in your life happen the way you want them to happen. And if they do, then you're happy. But if all the happenings don't happen the way you want them to happen, then guess what? You're unhappy. Thank God there is no word in the dictionary for unjoy. Joy is completely independent from the situation around you. Biblical joy is not circumstantial. It's not based on favorable circumstances. It's not based on the conditions being, you know, just right. You know, your finances are in perfect order. You know, people are liking all your posts on social media. Can I tell, if, can I tell you this? None of that really matters when it comes to biblical joy. None of that matters. Listen, it doesn't matter what people say, what people think, what people do. Joy is completely independent of all that. You can be under attack and full of joy. Now look at the analogy that Jesus used in verse 21. He said, a woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. I got to tell you, Jesus is masterful, is he not? Good, four of you. I said, Jesus. Amen. Let me give you all another chance. Ready? I said, Jesus is masterful. Amen. I mean, we're going to pull some practical things out of these verses, but I also want you to know something else that he's doing on an entirely different level here. Do you know right here he is prophesying about his own death, resurrection, his mission, and his purpose? He says about this woman who's about to give birth, this woman who's about to produce new birth, that she has pain when it happens. And we know this, that in the ancient world, every single time a new baby came into the world, it is because a woman, a mom, put her own life at risk. He says she has that baby when her hour has come. That's a very strange way of saying that a, a pregnancy is, is, is due. Her hour has come. Every other place that Jesus ever, ever says uh, the hour has come, He's always talking about his own death. Listen to me carefully. Jesus, in this one verse, he preaches the gospel. He says in this one verse, I will take all of the pain. And it won't just be physical pain for me. It'll be emotional pain when everyone abandons me. And it'll be spiritual pain when I cry out, my God, my God, why have you... I'll take all the pain and I won't only risk my life... I will give my life so that you can have a new birth. Amen. Now when Jesus uses this metaphor, you also understand that this is B.E. Before epidural. So that means, really this doesn't mean, that the moment the baby is born, the pain and the discomfort goes away. That's not what this means. It says, the baby makes her forget the pain. Her body still has pain. But the joy of seeing the baby grabs hold of her mind. She has pain. But she's not thinking about the pain. Pain doesn't control her thinking anymore. Oh, I hope you get that. 
You know what that means? That means this, ready? Biblical joy can coexist with sorrow. And my family, that is powerful and liberating. Let me tell you how. Joy gets the delivering mom through the pain. The joy causes her to overcome the pain. The joy eclipses the pain. The joy keeps the pain from controlling her. See, the pain pales in comparison to the joy. The, the pain doesn't regulate her anymore. The pain doesn't govern her anymore. She, see, now, now she's not reacting like she was a few minutes ago. Now that the baby's come, now she's talking differently. <laughs> and now she's treating those around her very differently. <laughs> she loves her husband again. Right. No, you breathe. No, she's not doing that anymore. <laughs> no, you. <laughs> she's not trying to pull the IV out of her arm and say, you know what, I got to get out of here. I can't do this right now. She's not doing, she's not acting crazy anymore. Listen, listen. Why? Why, why is she, why all of a sudden now she's chill? She's smiling. Want to know why? Because now she's focused on the blessing. She's not focused on the pain. Oh, the pain's still there. The discomfort's still there. The circumstance hasn't changed all that much, except for the fact that she's focused on the blessing. Hallelujah. What, what, is, is it because she's not in pain anymore? No, no, no. Wait, is it because she's not in any discomfort anymore? Has her body magically snapped back into a size six? No. But joy has come. Are you hearing me? Joy has come. Listen, you may have difficult situations. You, you may still be in difficult circumstances right now. The challenges haven't changed. You may still be dealing with pain and loss. There may be a sorrowful and disappointing situation that you are in the very midst of right now but I got to tell you something your joy is bigger your joy is bigger oh say it say my joy is bigger yeah joy overrides joy outweighs joy gets the victory joy prevails over sorrow see that's how the joy of the Lord is your strength Please understand this. This isn't a joy that tries to get you to avoid pain or ignore pain. This, this, this is a joy that enables you to still remain engaged and give attention to what you need to give attention to. While at the same time, underlying, you have an assurance and a confidence that cannot be shaken. See, th this joy runs deep. While you deal with the difficulty rather than run from it. Now the world's joy is completely circumstantial. Completely circumstantial. Uh, in the world, people have joy because things are going well for them. People have joy because they have a lot of money or they have, you know, a great job. They've got a solid relationship. They've got a nice house. They've got a new car. But let me ask you a question. If that's where, if that's the source of your joy, then what happens when those circumstances change? See, in the world, you can go from joy to sorrow. In the world, joy and sorrow are mutually exclusive. They cannot coexist. You either have joy or you have sorrow. In the world, and from a worldly mindset, sorrow actually eats up worldly joy. But biblical joy is different. Biblical joy takes you through it. See, see, 
If your joy is your relationship with God, if your joy is the fact that you're accepted by him, if your joy is that you know that God loves you, if your joy is the love of Jesus Christ, then listen, 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 then when sorrow comes, it actually drives you into joy. Let me explain. It pushes you into joy. Here's how. For instance, if you lose your job, if you lose your job, it doesn't steal your joy. You may have lost your job, but you did not lose your joy because you can't lose your joy. Are you hearing me? You may have lost your job, but you still have joy. So what happens is losing your job drives you into trusting Jesus even more, and Jesus himself is your joy. Follow me here. Just, just as salt goes into meat to keep it from going bad, joy goes into sorrow to keep it from going bad. In other words, the joy that Jesus gives prevents you from having your sorrow turn into despair. The joy that Jesus gives prevents disappointment from turning into depression. See, it stops you from getting bitter. It stops you from getting despondent. The circumstance doesn't get rid of the joy. But, but, but listen to me, listen to me. Here's the key, ready? Here's the key. You got to see something. He said, you can have this, but you've got to see something. And he said it over and over and over again. In verse 16, he said, you won't see me. And then you'll see me. In verse 17, the disciples say, so what did he mean by we won't see him? And then we'll see him. In verse 19, Jesus repeats it again. And then in verse 22, he says, therefore you now have sorrow. But I will see you again and your heart will rejoice, and your joy no one will take from you. He is saying, when you see the resurrection, it will bring you joy. You won't see me for three days. But on the third day, the stone will be rolled away. Why do you seek the living from among the dead? He is not here he is risen. Listen to me. You'll see me again. And when you see me, you'll have a joy that nobody can take from you. Listen. When, listen to me. When they saw that he was raised from the dead, it made them think. It forced them to radically rethink everything. How many of you know the resurrection of Jesus Christ changes everything so they thought wait a minute wait a minute if he's risen from the dead wait a minute if if three days ago all of our hopes and all of our dreams and all of our desires actually died when he died on that cross we couldn't figure it out how could he let this happen he who raised the dead who who cleansed the leper who caused the blind to see how could he this is the worst thing ever if all of our dreams and hopes died with him on a hill outside of Jerusalem three days ago well then if he's alive <laughs> <laughs> if he's alive, then all of our dreams and all of our hopes and all of our aspirations are alive as well. They're resurrected. They're better than before they were dead. Now there's resurrection power in our hopes, in our dreams, in our aspirations. Listen, we live because he lives. They're thinking, wait a second, we got to rethink the cross. We thought the, we thought the cross was the ultimate defeat. It's the ultimate victory. We thought the cross was the end. It's not. It's the ultimate new beginning. To see the risen Christ meant suddenly all, all the truths of the gospel, they all come alive now. 
And the same exact thing is true for you and I today in 2019. To see the risen Christ is where all of the promises and the privileges come alive for us. It's where the post-resurrection positioning that you've been graced with in, in that you are in him. Listen, that comes alive now when you see that he is risen from the dead. No wonder the Bible says that we are risen in him. Listen to me. We come alive when he is risen. So how do most people deal with pain? How do most people deal with pain? Most people deal with pain one of three ways. The first way is they, they, uh, they numb themselves. Right? When people have pain, they numb themselves. Alcohol, partying, drugs overworking, whatever it may be, what they do is they try to, you know, in one way or another, they're trying to drown their sorrows. The only thing is sorrows swim, right? <laughs> secondly, how do people try to deal with their pain? Well, secondly, some people try to avoid pain. They just try to avoid it. In other words, if they see pain coming, they'll do anything to avoid having a painful situation. So, in other words, they'll sell out, so they, they'll manipulate other people. As long as they don't lose what they think they might be losing, they try to go ahead and avoid it. And thirdly, people do it by numbing themselves, by avoiding pain. And thirdly, people try to turn their mind away. They just try to turn their mind away. In other words, oh, don't think about that. Think about, think happy, go to your happy place. Think, some, think about happy things. Think about positive things. You know, don't, don't let it get to you. Uh, get a new hobby. Um, go to the beach. Hey, hey, do some retail therapy. Go shopping. <laughs> See, in all of these instances, some of you are writing down retail <laughs> therapy. That is not what you should be getting from this message. But if you think about it, the way that people, most people deal with pain, the three different ways that people deal with pain, in all of those instances, people are simply saying, when you encounter pain, turn your brain off. That's what they're saying. Just turn your brain off. But that is not at all what the Bible says. The world's joy comes from not thinking too much. The Bible says... If you're not experiencing joy, you're not thinking enough. See, you're not thinking through the implications and the applications of what you actually believe. My family in the moment, when you're under fire, when you're tempted to fall into despair, think it out, think it through, call to mind, recall, remember. Listen, there are times that I, I know, I know, that sometimes we think, you know, you can have a week full of problems. You can come in here on Sunday and you can just dance your problems away. You can praise your problems away. You can shout your problems away. And listen, I'm for all of that. Please keep shouting, keep dancing, keep praising. But there are just some things. There's other things. That you have to break down and think through. Listen to me. you got to break certain things down so that your joy lasts past the parking lot. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, you don't need two hours of relief. I said you don't need just two hours of relief. You need 24-7, 365 relief. And you have it because it's been grace to you by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now you got to tap in. I said, now you got to tap in. See, this has got to work when you get back to the dry place. This has got to work when you get back to the tough place. You got, when you get back between a rock and a hard place, when you go back to work, when you, listen, when you get in the arena again, you, you've got to know that you've still got a river way down deep that you can draw from. And you got to know how. Th thank God for the joy that is in this room. I said, thank God for the joy that is in the... 
This is a testament to the power and presence, plan and purpose of God that there's always joy in this house. In his presence, his fullness of joy. Listen, let there always be an unlimited flow of joy in this house, but there's also got to be an unlimited flow of joy at your house. In your heart. Can't be limited to church. It can't be limited to when the pastor preaches. It can't be limited to when the worship team worships. Listen to me. It's got to work at work. It's got to work when you're in the storm. It's got to work when people oppose you and people treat you unfairly. It has to work when you're hard pressed on every side. It's got to work when you're mega stressed. It's got to work when you feel like you're coming unglued. It's got to work when you're on the battlefield. It's got to work when you're in the lion's den. It's got to work when you're in the fiery furnace and it's turned up seven times hotter. It's got to work. Then when the heat is on, the joy of the Lord better be your strength. You need a joy that comes from your soul. You need a, a joy that comes up out of your spirit. A joy that you can draw on and drink from all by yourself. And you can't, get that. you can't get that from turning off your brain. You can't get that from checking your brain at the door. You can't get that from disengaging. That, that's the, world brand, the, the world's brand of pseudo joy, process joy, faux joy. Let me just say it like this. The world's joy is a stupid joy. I said it's a, excuse me, I'm sorry, not really. It's a stupid joy. It's a stupid joy. The world says, listen, you can have joy as long as you don't think too much. But when you become numb to the pain and the disappointment, you also become numb to genuine joy. Biblical joy is intelligent joy. Say that with me today. Biblical joy is intelligent joy. The more you think it out and you think it through and the more you think about what you really believe, the more joy you will tap into and experience. Listen, remembering in the moment, in the pain, in the stretching, in the sorrow, in the, listen, the more you think about it, the more you'll, listen, if you remember in the loss. If, if you recall, if, you remember, if in that moment you remember who your God is and who you are in him, if you remember in that moment what he has promised you and that he is faithful, that he's not a man that he should lie, that everything he promised is true. If you remember in that, if you think it through what your glorious future looks like and what amazing abilities and gifts and opportunities he's given you in this life, listen, listen, and then on top of that, the cherry on top of it all is the epic joy of answered prayer. This is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if he hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that, we, that he, we've desired of him. Look, look at what Jesus said right in this context, right? right in the context of joy. He said, and in that day you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. Listen, part of your joy, a big part of your joy, is that if you ask anything in Jesus' name, the Father will give it to you. So, what meaneth this? What does it mean... To ask in Jesus' name. How many of you know it's not just an addendum at the end of a prayer? It's not just like, it's not like, well, you used to end every prayer with this, and now you, you end with in Jesus' name. That's not what it is. Are you all following me? Some of you just 
right over your head, but that's okay. All the Catholics felt me in that moment, okay, right? You used to, right? Whatever. And now, oh, now I'm a Christian, so now I end the prayer with, in Jesus' name. That's not what it means. It's not just an addendum. You don't just tack that on at the end of a prayer. What does it mean to pray in Jesus' name? Well, it means a lot. It means a lot of things. But two of the primary things it means to pray in Jesus' name is this. To pray in Jesus' name is to pray with deep humility and infinite confidence. Deep humility and infinite confidence. See, if you go to prayer, and, and you go to the Lord in prayer, and you, and you ask, well, Lord, I'm asking for this, and I've been praying about this for a long, and Lord, I pray every day. I pray every day. I pray an hour every day, Lord, and I read four chapters. I've been reading for a long, Lord, I've got this many verses memorized. You know, Lord, I've been good. I've been really good lately, except when I'm not. But, but I, mostly I've been really good and, I, and I'm in church every week. And I do this and I do that and I do... So Lord, I'm asking. Lord, Lord, I've been faithful. Lord, I've served. So now I ask. If you pray like that and you're wondering why your prayers have not been answered, it's because you're praying in your name. Not in Jesus' name. Even if you say, in Jesus' name, you're praying in your name. So every time we get angry or we get upset because we haven't received something in prayer, it is almost always because we think we deserve what we prayed for. <laughs> to pray in Jesus' name is, 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 Father, you don't owe me anything. Ever. I cannot earn, deserve, or merit anything from you. That's why I'm coming to you in Jesus' name. I'm not coming to you based on my goodness. I'm coming to you based on his goodness. Deep humility. But not only is it deep humility, it's also radical confidence. Unlimited confidence. Why? Because when you go in Jesus' name... You can know that God the Father will be as attentive and desirous to fulfill your desire as if it were Jesus himself asking. Pr praying in Jesus' name affords you incredible confidence. But, but I want you to understand this too. I want you to understand that when you go to God, you always go to God as your father. As your, he's a father. Say that with me. He's a father. Now God's a lot of things. He's creator. He's, he's king. He's, he's, he's the just judge of all the universe. But Jesus said, every time Jesus taught about prayer, he said, you go to him as a father. Our father who art in heaven, hallowed be. That you go to him as a father. Now, understand the analogy because we know this. Those of us who are parents here, you know that stuff happens with your kids. That sometimes your kids want something that you know they shouldn't want. Or your kids want something, especially when they're little, like when they're toddlers. There's certain things they want. You know, your, your toddler wants to stick a Lego up his nose for some bizarre reason. But you're going to stop your kid from sticking a Lego up their nose. Amen? Amen. There, there are little toddlers who want to go play in areas that they should never be playing in. If you're out at a playground and all of a sudden your little toddler wants to go in an area where there's broken glass all over the place and they can get hurt, what's that father or mother going to do? They're going to pick up that toddler and say, no, you can't play there. Can I ask you a question? What's the toddler going to do? The toddler's going to scream and cry and kick and try to free him or herself. But then a good parent, what, a, what does a good parent do? Takes them over to a safe place puts them down, and the child stops the screaming and stops the crying and stops the wailing, and all of a sudden is really happy. The parent, the parent fulfilled the desire of the child 
in a better way. Oh, I'm going to say it again. The parent fulfills the request, the desire, the prayer of the child, but in a better way. See, God always, God will always give you what you ask for if you knew everything he knows. Sila, think on that. God will always give you what you ask for if you knew everything he knows. How many of you know the parent knows more than the two and a half year old? So let's say that distance is parent, two and a half year old. How many of you know the distance between God the Father and us is a lot bigger? How many of you know God knows what's best for us at an infinitely higher level? He grants our request, but in a better way. Listen to me. That should bring you immense joy. Here's why. Your Father in heaven always, always, always has your very best interest at heart. And if you understand that God the Father sees you in Christ, he sees you as his son. And yet you feel like what you have asked for is being delayed or it's being denied. Listen, you can have immense confidence. It is never because God is being inattentive. It is never because God is punishing you. It is never because God doesn't love you. Listen to me. God loves you at the same level and to the same degree with affectionate and intense care as he loves his son Jesus. Jesus Christ. So, if what you have prayed for is being delayed or denied, it is only because God is fulfilling the request with something much, much better. Somebody needs to say, I received that today. Man, there's some of us who have been wondering why the thing we've been asking for hasn't happened. And we've been asking for 20 years. It, listen, if that is you, if you've been waiting a long time for something to change, you've been waiting a long time for God to come through, you've been waiting a long time for things to change to the way you think they ought to change, and they haven't changed yet, you ought to be the most happiest person in the room because that means that door has been shut by the one who shuts doors that no man can open only so that he can open to you a better, a greater, a more wonderful, a more fulfilling door than you could have ever thought or imagined. That's how good your God is. I said that's how good your God is. Ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened unto you for everyone who asks receives. And everyone who seeks finds. And everyone who knocks the door will be opened unto them. Or what man is there among you who if his son asks for bread will give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish will give him a snake. If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more does your heavenly father know how to give good gifts to his children. A good gift is on the way. I said a good gift is on the way. A good gift. Oh, I said a good gift is on the way. You may have been praying for a particular thing asking and you've been believing for a particular answer a, a certain way that you wanted God to provide I'm here to tell you today that something more beneficial something more profitable something of greater value and worth if your answer has not come it is because God has something better for you he's opening a much better door he's got something much much better for you and listen to me that's a source of great joy man that's a truth that can set you free oh that should make you shout for joy 
You have a resource you can't get anywhere else. It's inevitable. It's unstoppable. You have, listen to me, you have supernatural strength like a river running deep down in the recesses of your soul. You have a river of joy that never runs dry. It can never be extinguished. It can never be exhausted. It can never be depleted. It can never be deleted. It can never be eclipsed. It can never be silenced. And it gets you through the pain and through the storm. It's bigger than any source of sorrow. It's inexpressible. It's unspeakable and full of glory. You are strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. You have the strength of a mighty warrior on the inside of you because the joy of the Lord is your strength. 